I really want to tell you um, about quantum simulation computation in these um, array platforms because it fits best. I would just like to point out how close the connection is between precision experiments of atomic clocks and um, what we're trying to do in quantum computing with neutral atoms. And also atomic clocks is an area where Japanese researchers have played a prominent role. Um, so atomic clocks now can, for instance, you be entangled to increase the uh, atomic precision, and, but they use relatively simple symmetric entangled states, uh, for instance, as achieved by um, you know, the famous Kitagawa Ueda proposal on spin squeezing uh, many years ago, which is now starting to become a reality in the best atomic clocks. And I would also like to point out that Professor Katori, um, his invention of the magic wavelength trap, which is now widely used for all the best optical clocks, was actually trying to solve a very different problem. He was not thinking of atomic clocks, he was thinking of optical qubits, and he was trying to get the coherence time very long, and then it has influenced this other field. So basically, you should think of these experiments as high precision experiments at a level of or similar to optical clocks, so approaching that level, but in with much more complicated entangled states, and I think this is a good perspective. So I would like to tell you a little bit about um, individual and cold and trapped atoms as quantum bits. Uh, you have seen a lot here. I would just like to give a little bit of credit to Philippe Grangier's group, um, who saw this first. Um, and then I will tell you um, about um, simulation and computation experiments that you can kind of group in analog and digital experiments with these Rydberg systems. So um, basically, um, this is an very surprising uh, quote from 1983 by Richard Feynman, where he says, now we can, in principle, make a computing device in which the numbers are presented by a row of atoms with each atom in either the two of the two states. That's our input. Then the Hamiltonian starts. The ones move around, the zeros move around. Finally, a particular bunch of atoms represents the answer. Nothing could be made smaller, nothing could be more elegant. I mean, it's almost like he watched some of the presentations earlier today and then came up with this, uh, right? Moving the atoms around, um, representing the qubits in internal states, applying Hamiltonians, etc. So this was really visionary. Um, so maybe just to give credit to this work uh, by Philippe Granger now, 22 years ago, um, this is what started the field. Um, it was well-known laser cooling and trapping in optical traps and dipole traps, both Einstein condensates and so on. What um, Granger and his group tried is to make a very tightly focused trap using a microscope objective uh, with a trap size less than one micrometer, um, and then running a magneto-optical trap, cooling the atoms, and observing through the same microscope objective that is used to create this very focused trap to observe the atoms. And so he saw this remarkable um, kind of telegraph signal where um, basically there were two levels of fluorescence from, from the trap. There was the background level, which corresponds to no atoms, and then one atom in the trap, and what is markedly absent is two atoms, right? You would have expected a Poissonian distribution with, you know, a second step, a third step, etc. cetera. Um, and this was absent. This is only absent in small traps because what happens is that the trap volume is so small that there's an excitation to a molecular potential and two atoms are very quickly lost, so quickly that you can't see the fluorescence from that level. Um, so this was really, really a breakthrough uh, experiments. By now we have learned even you know, the traps can be also two micro and so on with some other laser cooling tricks to prepare these singles atoms, but this is forming the basis of everything. Um, this is basically um, the, the idea of, that was around, but people didn't try it until 2016. Um, this was done by our collaboration at Harvard and MIT um, and also by um, Antoine Brovet's group. And the only thing I would like to point out is maybe the year. This happened in 2016. You have seen earlier today that already in 2014, the superconducting qubits were below the error threshold, right? And Google acquired the Martinez group, right? This only came out in 2016, and you will see that you now a few years later, we are also above or below threshold um, for quantum error correction. So this field has been uh, very, very rapidly developing.
And so what is nice about these systems is that the atoms, unless you excite them to Rydberg states, they don't really interact at all with one another. So it's very, very easy to scale them up. You don't have to you know, fabricate more identical qubits. You also don't have to make your traps larger as for ions. You can basically scale it up. And you have seen, um, I think, record-breaking results um, from Professor Mori's group at 800 atoms or so. We are doing 500s now. And my prediction is very easily, within one to two years, will be at the level of 10,000, maybe 100,000 um, physical qubits, and I will tell you a little bit where these limits come from. And basically this shows, you know, sorting examples where we sort in this case into a 225 um, atom uh, array. And you can also do the thing in 3D. This is a beautiful experiment by Antoine Brouvet's group. Um, of course, you can see which country he comes from by the choice. Um, maybe if you do three-dimensional things, you can do your <laughs> Chicago Tower one day. Um, but um, so these are beautiful. We kind of prefer the 2D approach because it's a natural way to use the third dimension to address the atoms without having to avoid atoms that are on the way that are in 3D. But in principle, in 3D, of course, you can pack more, more atoms into the, into the volume. Okay, so, um, so, and the main thing about this is that not only can we, um, you know, trap atoms and resolve them optically, but we can induce uh, via these Rydberg interactions, um, you know, in strong interactions over optical resolvable distances. And just for the theorists among you who like to see Hamiltonians, I think you haven't seen it yet today, um, the Hamiltonian consists of, you know, sigma x term, which Rabi flops the atom between the ground and the Rydberg state with some Rabi frequency and phase, amplitude and phase that is controlled, this capital omega, the Rabi frequency. Then there's a detuning term uh, coming from here, basically is it energetically favorable or not to excite an atom or to have a photon around. And then this is the interaction term. And this interaction term can be either made to um, be next neighbor atoms, or as um, Hannes has also shown, you can you know, use this interaction term to exclude many different atoms within the so-called blockade radius in the region over which this term here dominates everything else. This is what we call the blockade radius. This is basically where you don't get the multiple excitations. So let me show you a few results over the past few years on quantum simulation. Um, this was our uh, first result um, in in this system, you see Hannes was actually here the lead author. Um, so this was a 1D system. These um, Rydberg interactions give naturally rise to an antiferromagnetic order. And in 2017, we had a coherence length of about five to six atoms out of a linear chain of um, uh, up to 50, 51 atoms. If you're wondering, you know, we were trying a few, then 13, then I think 30 something, and then 51, and then we stopped. Um, that's why um, I think the Sycamore <laughs> quantum processor is also in this region. They have 53, I think, or something, 52 or 53. Um, now, um, two, two years or three years later, 2021, we did similar experiments in 2D. Um, so here we sort the system into um, either a square lattice or a hexagonal lattice or a triangular lattice and then apply this antiferromagnetic interaction and you see these nice nice patterns um, that you these antiferromagnetic patterns that you can do in all geometries and in these systems now the interaction sorry now the interaction uh, correlation length is now 11 in each direction, so basically almost the whole thing is the whole ensemble, the whole 200-something atoms are um, entangled with one another and strongly correlated. We played a little bit with the uh, blockade radius. So if you make the blockade radius in the square, this is always a square lattice, for example. If you make the blockade radius such that it only excludes the next neighbors, then you get this checkerboard pattern. Every red circle indicates a Rydberg atom, which is then blown out so you don't see it in the image. Um, so this is for small blockade radius. If you increase the blockade radius so that it doesn't, doesn't only block the next four next neighbors, but also the diagonal neighbors, you get a new pattern uh, in the system. Here you see some kind of um, error in the system. And so you basically get, the the, even for the same square lattice geometry, you get different emerging orders depending on how many atoms you're blocking by your central atoms. Um, we also at the time created uh, the larger GSG state, which was 20 atoms. By now, I think the record is 20 something. 
in, uh, in superconducting systems. Um, and this was done in a 1D chain. Um, and there, because it was 1D, the edges were special. So we had to do uh, special light shift tricks in order to improve the preparation. And um, basically, here you see density, density correlations across the whole, the whole system. And um, we saw, you know, basically this um, collective flopping at the la faster phase evolution rate um, up to 20 atoms. Um, these were all expected results. The one thing in the field that has been surprising was so-called quantum many-body scars. So what we tried in this experiment is we prepared the state. So here this was now for 13 or something, or one, two, three, four, sorry. One, two, three, four. Yeah, nine, maybe 11, what does it say, nine. Um, so we prepare the ferromagnetic state, as you can see here on the left. So we adiabatically prepare it, and then we suddenly quenched it. We suddenly jumped onto resonance. And what we expected to see and to study is thermalization in the system. We wanted to see how fast does the system thermalize, because the system has two to the 11 states, so many, many quantum states in the system. But to our surprise, what we saw instead are these persistent oscillations where basically the antiferromagnetic order switches from one to the other to the next one and back, which is particularly surprising because in order to, for instance, excite this atom to the Rydberg state, you have to de-excite both of these, but you have to somehow keep the memory of that so that you know that you excite this one and then go back to that one. Now it is understood as a general ph phenomenon that is widely studied um, in these systems where you have basically groups of states. These are not single quantum states, but groups of states that show similar behavior um, and give rise to these long uh, lasting correlations, and we see that this is a very um, s standard phenomenon. We saw it with nine atoms. We saw almost the same um, oscillation with 51 atom in one-dimensional chains, and when we repeated the experiments with two-dimensional chains, we always saw basically independent of geometry, independent, independent of dimensionality, we saw this persistent oscillations in this quantum, strong interacting quantum many-body um, systems, and we found also that they can be stabilized by driving. Um, and then we said, can we do a useful problem, a problem that is maybe useful beyond, um, beyond physics? Um, so we looked at uh, one example of an optimization problem and wanted to see whether analog quantum simulation of this optimization problem gives an advantage, the fact that you have a quantum system. And the problem we chose um, was uh, the maximally independent set. Um, so that is a graph problem where basically you're given a graph and you're given connections between the vertices on the graph, and your goal is to color um, the maximum number of vertices with the constraint that any two vertices that are connected by a line cannot be colored simultaneously. So you see this really looks like the Rydberg problem in the sense that you know, if all the lines represent blockade, then you can excite this atom to the Rydberg state, but you cannot excite any of the, of the neighbors to the Rydberg state. Um, and this is um, classically a very hard computational problem. It's MP-complete. And so to see that this is not trivial, we did a geometry. So even if you restrict yourself to so-called unity disk graphs, the graphs where you block just the next neighbors, you see if you prepare, for instance, this geometry is pre prepared on purpose, it's by no means obvious what the correct solution um, to this system is. And for instance, this would have been the correct solution to this problem. So the way we run it, we prepare these atoms and then we adiabatically ramp to the antiferromagnetic order, and that in the ideal case, um, by the adiabatic theorem, you start with a ground state of the system. If there are no excitations that you create in the ramping process, you should end up with the ground state, and the ground state should be the solution to the MIS problem. The problem, of course, there is that we have only finite time for ramping due to decoherence, etc. And on the other hand, you know, some level crossings may come very close to one another, and so you may introduce errors. But nonetheless, we um, looked at this. And then to compare it fairly, we compared it to classical annealing with the same number of steps, effectively. We, we took the coherence time as a being a step in the classical annealing process, and then we compared the two. Um, and what we found is that there is a speed up for the quantum process, um, as indicated by the blue line, but the speed up is only approximately quadratic. So it's not this exponential speed up that we all dream about when we talk about um, quantum computer. It's a moderate uh, speed up, and these quadratic speeds up are kind of 
very standard in a number of algorithms, Grover's algorithm, etc. They have to do simply with addition of amplitudes instead of probabilities, and then you square them and you get this. Nonetheless, we are still studying these data. We have an enormous amount of data, and we are looking at, you know, trying to see, for instance, are there instances where the solution is very hard for the classical problem, but relatively easy for the quantum problem, because then a quantum process would also be useful. Um, and we understand that basically, the systems um, that have one true ground states and then many states, just one, say one error above, these are very hard for classical machines just because there's so many minima that the system can be stuck in, whereas the quantum, uh, quantum processor seems to have an advantage, uh, particularly there. Um, yeah, I forgot to say in the beginning for disclosure, um, Michel Lucas and Markus Greinand are Marcus Grein and I are co-founders of uh, Quera Computing. This is a Boston-based uh, startup, uh, which has now grown to 45 people or so. Um, and since um, last October, um, you can basically use the 300 atom machine quantum simulator uh, and access this on, on AWS. And uh, some of the theorists do, they um, use this machine to you know, test some of, some of their models. Um, so this was quite an interesting journey to make it available at particular times during the day so you can um, you know, remotely access it and, and use it. Um, so now this was all analog. Um, now let's switch to digital. And we have seen beautiful examples already here today from Professor Mori, from uh, Hannes Bernian, etc. Um, so we tried to look at um, basically make good quantum gates. How far can we push it? Um, so these were our first results. Um, maybe, maybe Hannes remembers, maybe around 2019, 2020, um, were single at qubit fidelity gates, and now we have extended it to a single qubit um, rotation fidelity of almost four nines. The error is now two times 10 to the minus four. Um, so that's well above any threshold of interest, or this is, you know, the single qubit gates are very good. I would also like to point out, um, and somebody else said it, maybe, maybe it was um, Ken before, you know, basically idling errors are absent for us as well, because, you know, the coherence time is seconds, so, you know, if we do pi pulse, at least um, some dynamical decoupling, you ha don't have to worry about this. But this result means that we pretty much don't have to worry about single qubit gates, and the only thing that we have to worry about is two qubit gates. Um, and so here, for instance, we did an experiment on uh, 10 uh, two-qubit pairs of atoms, and we got um, basically a fidelity, and I think um, Hannes has already mentioned this, of 99.5%, so we are now below um, the error threshold for the surface code um, in the system. And we understand also, we think these errors, um, they are about... Um, 0.2 to 0.3% are from finite laser power. What I didn't tell you is we do the excitation to the Rydberg state as a two-photon uh, two process. And you know, given the laser power, we have a finite detuning from the intermediate states, and that leads to photon scattering. That's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, and then 0 0.1 is about the temperature of the atoms, um, which is a little bit similar to what uh, Kenji Ohmori presented earlier today. This is what he tried to solve by squeezing. We are not yet cooling to the ground state here, but this is basically the variation of the distances between the atoms uh, in the two qubit gate. And then about 0.1 also is the Doppler effect. So these two latter ones we can solve um, with, um, with basically um, making the atoms colder, laser cooling them um, to the ground state, which we are not doing right now with Raman side band cooling. In any case, um, this is a promising, um, promising result, and this was now for two rows of atoms, so 30 pairs of atoms, actually, and you can see that all the errors for all of the qubits are quite small. Um, you know, maybe for two of them, they are kind of two times 10 to the minus three or so, um, further away than the other, so the minimum is 99.1. So we are below the error of the threshold of the surface code. Um, we also would like to be able to you know, do mid-circuit readouts. So we tested whether entanglement survives transport. Um, so what we did in this experiment here is we entangled pairs of atoms, created a bell state, um, and then measured the parity oscillations of the bell state. This is um, the black curve uh, down there stationary. And then what we did is we transported the entanglement, we transported the atoms by to a distance of 100 micrometers and transported them back and then looked at the uh, surviving parity um, oscillations and basically you see no difference between the two as long as the average um, transport 
time or our transport speed is um, something like 100 micrometers in 100 microseconds or so. So about one, one meter per second. Um, and there's just some very simple dynamical decoupling here to keep, um, to keep the system. What I should point out, maybe it's not clear to the non-experts here, we're actually using three different levels. We're using as a qubit the so-called clock states, hyperfine ground states, which have these long coherence times of seconds. And only when we want to introduce interaction, we map one of the qubit states onto the Rydberg state for a brief period and then back down. Um, and the, uh, the data are basically stored as um, hyperfine ground state qubits of very long coherence times. Um, we did um, then first experiments on a surface code and also on a toric code. Um, basically, even though our atoms are in two dimensions, because we can move them around freely, we can in principle make codes in any number of dimensions. Um, so we also implemented um, this ter toric codes. And basically what these data um, tell you without going too much detail into it, is that the, ancilla, uh, the ancillas, the so-called measurement qubits, the one that uh, detect the errors, agree with the me directly measured errors in the data uh, qubits um, to a good degree. Um, so what this looks like, I will show you in a movie. This is actually the Tori code implemented. What you will see is you will see stationary atoms. These are the data qubits. And you, then you will see moving atoms. These are the uh, ancilla or measurement qubits that measure the parity. Um, and this is a toric code, and whenever a red circle appears like so, that's the application of a, of a Rydberg gate. And so what you will see here is basically one Rydberg gate, the ancillas are transported second, third, fourth, and then there's one more motion because we need a, for a torus to bring the atoms all the way around, final Rydberg gate, and then they are transported to a readout zone, zone over here. Um, and so basically this is how we run the code. So in the beginning when we started this, we had the idea that one needed basically one laser beam per qubit independently controlled. Now we understand that many of these things can be parallelized. This was actually a single control signal that was driving all the atoms around, right? So basically the way you should think about it, the way we now think about it, you need to generate patterns but you don't need one pattern per qubit in general. You need a finite number of patterns uh, to execute the codes, which makes the problem, of course, much, uh, much simpler than before. So um, maybe you've seen this picture. Um, so our you know, idea is that there will be two or probably three different zones. There's a computation zone where you perform uh, the Rydberg quantum gates and where the data qubits are stored. Then um, there's a readout zone where the ancilla qubits are transported to for mid-term, mid-circuit readout. Um, and then there may be up to two more zones. There might be a zone where you hide some of the data qubits if you don't want them to interact um, or perform gates with them. And then there might be necessary, I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, a very large zone for replenishing qubits um, that you're losing in the process. And there was a question about that, um, you know, there's this loss from just background collisions, but however, that's not the dominant loss. The dominant loss is actually that there's a small probability of the Rydberg state decaying. Somebody mentioned this also earlier in Jeff Thompson's work. And so um, you have to replenish atoms at a certain rate if you want to run large logical systems. Um, right now, I can't show you data. We are, um, we have first results, but we haven't published it yet or posted it yet. We are performing um, basically experiments with up to 10 logical qubits um, in um, color code uh, type of um, experiment like a steam code. We have now been able to measure, not to, yeah, to create and measure a GHZ state. No, not before we did a GHZ state of physical qubits. Now this is a GHZ state actually of logical qubits, um, of up to four logical qubits. And we can see that uh, not yet error correction, but error detection can increase the fidelity. So basically by using unc logical ancilla qubits to tell us when an error occurred and throwing those data away, we can basically improve the fidelity of the remaining uh, samples to very close to 100%. And this is a work in progress that we hope to uh, finish very soon. So we're now getting into the era where we're actually starting to perform first experiments with logical um, rather than physical um, qubits. 
So this is um, the example of the code, and there's a movie. The quality is not very good because we didn't take too many pictures yet, but basically now you see here uh, 10, um, 10 logical qubits, each being uh, a Steen code, um, and then there are basically transverse gates performed between them, and then the lower five qubits are used to detect errors um, and to throw away those data, um, and then the other ones are analyzed. Um, there's a GAG state creation and then analysis of the system. So um, this is how what it looks like. So you can see the quantum gates up here. There's some storage region over here um, that is not affected by the Rydberg quantum gates, um, et cetera. So this is kind of how the system works. Um, so maybe just a few remarks on scaling up uh, computers. Actually, this part I will not show because Hannes has already shown it. Um, the main message here is, as he has shown, is that um, you know, we will, the idea is that you know, there will be a module size a maximum um, module size for any systems, you know, in the superconducting qubits, it will be maybe the size of the fridge. Uh, for us, there are two limits that kind of set in at a similar atom number, physical qubit number of maybe 10 to 100,000. One limit is that we need about one milliwatt per trap. Um, so 100,000 traps is 100, 100 watts, right? That's maybe kind of the maximum laser that we'll get and there to put through the microscope objectives, but um, that's in the range. Um, the other one is the field of view of the microscope. Um, we are not at the one micron level, like Kenji is, but we are at the three micron uh, spacing level. We have a field of view of one millimeter, so that's 300 by 300. That's also 10 to the five uh, traps. Now, the second problem, as Misha likes to point out, is maybe solved by money. After all, when they do you know, these big lithography machines, they do you know, this size field of view um, systems, but that will uh, probably be very expensive. But it's interesting that kind of maybe at 100,000 uh, qubit limit, and I think we will be between 10 and 100,000 in, in within a year or so, year and a half maybe, there will be a module size, and then you have to think uh, to how to connect modules, and I think this basically generating remote bell pairs, and we have seen also beautiful work um, by in a previous talk by um, Professor Takao. Um, Takao, um, we have um, basically um, you need you know moderate moderate bell pairs with fidelity above um, ninety percent or so, um, but you need many of them. You need maybe you know ten to the four, ten to the five pairs per second. So the main challenge is maybe not so much the bell fidelity if you want to connect modules, but actually um, the generation rate that you need um, to uh, perform logical calculations. Okay, so um, I will not show this. Maybe um, just to summarize where I see things, as I said, uh, I will predict that we will be at you know, over 10,000, maybe cl closer to 100,000 physical qubits within the next uh, one to two years. There are no obvious roadblocks to that. Um, the lasers are there, uh, the things are there. Um, it is also very clear that quantum simulators are useful for science. Uh, quantum error correction seems seems feasible, maybe not at the level yet where we can do you know 10 to the 12 operations, but maybe 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 operations. Uh, within that uh, time frame, we can start to think about you know experiments with a number of logical qubits, maybe on the order of 10 or so. Um, my biggest question mark is actually about algorithms. Um, we really don't know, besides Shor as algorithm, whether they are useful algorithms that scale exponentially, right? I mean, maybe we are lucky and we try them out and then some of them will work, but that's kind of, you know, for me, that's the bigger risk in some sense than the hardware. I think the hardware um, we will solve collectively um, as a field, but um, the algorithms, um, it's, it's very in it's interesting, you know, is Shor's algorithm somehow an outlier and something very, very special, um, which would be, of course, a little bit disappointing or will there be other systems? So what are the two challenges that I see? Um, so one is speed for the, this is now particular to the um, atomic systems. Uh, we are limited by moving atoms to a you know, gate speed of something like maybe 100 microseconds. That can probably be shortened a little bit if you're only transporting the atoms locally for parity. That's more like tens of microseconds, but you know, it will be kind of in a 10 to 100 microsecond range. And then the mid-circuit readout, currently there's 500 microseconds. There's a little bit of a trade-off. You can read out much faster. For instance, people have read out, um, I think Jeff Thompson, also Manuel Endres, with 20 microseconds time frame, but then you lose the atom. So basically you can either scatter photons slowly and keep the atom and keep it cold, but then it takes maybe a millisecond, or do it very fast, but then you need to replenish more atom. And then 
The other question is basically you need to replenish all these atoms, ideally continuously while you're performing the operations. Um, and I've, you, know, you can estimate that that's a minimum of kind of delivering 100,000 atoms per second, 10 to the 5. But for you know, more realistic, are maybe a million or even 10 million atoms per second. If we can figure out a scheme to deliver 10 million atoms per second to the system while not touching the data qubits, we will be able to perform um, logical qubits. I'm very, very, um, you know, logical qubit calculations, large logical qubit calculations. But that's one of the yet unsolved technical problems. But it's um, good to know that a number, you know, of, of very smart people are working on it. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.